Thank you, OB, and good morning to everyone. And I'm so delighted to be here today to share my stories, experience, thoughts about business, team leadership, and just my own personal experiences. I've been working in HR um, for the last 30 years or so. And um, in my capacity, I've worked um, both as a HR officer, HR director, HR manager for multiple locations, um, not just Ghana, but West Africa um, and also in the UK. Um, as far as my personal life is concerned, I'm a mother of three children. I am married um, and I've been married for 30 years, in fact. So I think I, over the, the duration um, of my career, I've had a number of experiences that I hope we can share over the course of our discussion today. All right. Thank you very much for that. Uh, uh, one of my first questions I would like to ask you, in fact, is, is start with the curiosity, is uh, how did you start uh, in your business uh, career? I mean, why did you have to choose that area instead of maybe uh, being a teacher or something of that nature? Because there are many other things you could have do uh, in your professional work, but you decide to uh, follow the business ecosystem. Is there anything that lead you to that line or is it by accident? Yes, that's a very interesting question. And um, in fact, what happened was when I was at, whilst at university, I actually studied product development, food technology and product development. So my, my career was tracked for food technology, not HR at all. But whilst I was at university, I was able to um, gain some experience at a... Um, a, um, a logistics company and it was during that time that I started to get interested in managing people and that's because um, whilst I was there as a, the only black woman on the shop floor um, I encountered quite a bit of racism and what became obvious very quickly is that I had built a friendship with one of the union members. I didn't even know he was part of the union, but he was very, very keen to ensure that my best interests was protected. I don't even actually know whether the union was using me as a means of getting what they wanted. But what transpired is that one of the senior managers was in fact a known racist. And so I was asked to come in and um, see if I could talk to the manager and explain my background and my experience. It was during that conversation that I quickly realized that he did have issues with my identity. And it's funny, but we, um, well, initially we had a massive clash and the union backed me up. But following that, he became, we became very good friends. He gained a lot of respect for me. And I realized that through conversation, through um, understanding how people work, I was actually able to bridge the gap. And I didn't only become very good friends with that transport manager that was a known racist, but I also became um, very respected by the union because of the way that I handled the situation. And so um, as part of my work experience, I was asked to um, spend time in different departments. I spent time in marketing, I spent time in finance, I spent time on the shop floor, as I said, and also in HR. And it was the HR experience that I fell in love with and decided that this was the career that I wanted to pursue. So um, when I graduated, in fact, I started my career um, doing research in the hotel and catering industry looking at education, occupational standards. And then I went straight into um, training and development. And so that's where my career started. And the rest we can talk about, Neil. 
And the rest they say is history. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, sorry about that incident that, that usually come up uh, again and again and again in our, in our business and in our world, actually. Uh, there are people uh, who just are not comfortable and uh, we see other people that are different from them. And so for that, they have to make you feel their sense of inferiority, you know, which is really <laughs> unfortunate in most of the cases. Actually, it's unfortunate because we should have been able to uh, to live beyond that. But uh, still today, uh, we are still troubled uh, by the mere scene of somebody that have a different color because the person is taller than you. The person have a different gender. This should not be any problem anymore. We'll be here for too long a time to have be able to understand the all this. Anyway, uh, now I'm looking at uh, uh, also a little bit of leadership in business because if you are going to be leading a team, which is uh, the topic of our discussion this morning, and then of course the question of leadership become automatically important in those areas. So I'm trying to see here, how would you describe leadership in business? Um, that's, <clears throat> there's been many books and, and um, articles, um, universities that study this topic. Um, and it's been around for leadership has been defined as a distinction since the early 1900s. Um, we know that actually leadership has been around for a lot longer. You know, you even have to just look at the stories of Jesus and know that they're much of the stories there is based on his leadership qualities. But in the context of business as we know today, um, I'd like to use the um, saying that leadership is knowing what to do, whereas management is doing the right thing. So that, what does that actually mean? What I mean by that is Leadership is really where the vision and the mission of a business is held. It's the leader that tends to understand and articulate leadership to the rest of the team. So that, that clear vision is so important for the leader to know what that looks like. And I think in business, where, where businesses struggle is when the vision and the mission is not clear. So that clarity is something that comes with, with a clear understanding of what you want to achieve with this um, structure, be it a legal structure called a business, um, and you work towards achieving that, bringing along um, your team members so that the team members also understand what that is and they spend every day whilst at work ensuring that they support you in achieving that vision all right so vision of course become very important now because uh, yeah of course it's obvious no if you are going to be leading if you are going to be leading people to somewhere or an organization a business for a particular objective Yes, I, I agree with you 100% that you are, going to, you are going to have a vision. You are going to know where you are going. <laughs> is that you are setting up a structure. You already know where you want to go. That is not the responsibility of the people that are just working. It's your responsibility to be able to see what they cannot see. Otherwise, it becomes difficult for you to lead them. So these and many other characteristics or, um, or elements, of course, are very important in leading, in leading a business and in... In leadership generally so these are not quality that everybody have even though of course we have the possibility of able to develop them but we don't all develop them but for people like you who teach in this area who lead in this area and of course you need you have developed these uh, key attributes how was it for you growing up uh, with this attribute i mean i don't want to believe that when you just started you already know how to do all this one so take us along in a little bit of your journey how did you manage to uh, continue to master these different attribu uh, attributes that you needed to be able to uh, lead a business team? Yeah, is leadership learnt or is, are you born as a leader? Now, well, at the age of 18, I was, um, I was 
honoured enough to be selected onto a leadership training programme. Now, at the time, my confidence levels were so low, I didn't actually believe I was a leader. Um, but somebody saw something in me that meant that I was given the support, I was given a structure to actually learn how to become a, a, a more effective leader. So I had the innate qualities of leadership, and I would say that started from being the eldest in my, um, of my three siblings. I was given responsibility from a very early age. I was expected to look after my siblings. I was expected to take the lead in many um, situations, um, and that stayed with me. So when I was given the opportunity to take on this three-year leadership development program at the age of 18, what it did was just enhance those core skills, communication, vision, direction, focus, um, relationship, all those key qualities that I've used in order to position myself in my career, um, I learnt on this program. But what it did was just, um, the course actually helped me to distinguish or define what those attributes were and what I can do with those attributes. So whilst on the program, I networked with like-minded people. I was given opportunities to speak in front of large audiences. Um, I was given opportunities to dine with, with very important people. Um, I was given the opportunity to participate in some very high level meetings. And each time, I was put in those situations. Initially, I felt very scared, but I was able to find the courage to push through and stand for something in those situations, which meant that I was developing my attributes from that very early age. That prepared me for my first management role, um, which was um, as a junior manager for a small charity. Um, and whilst I was there, I set up my first business called Amos Recruitment and Training. So that's really where I began to see that I was a leader because that business, I had no one to rely on at that point, but myself. And so all of the training that I received previously became evident and became necessary. And I used that to grow my business over a 10 year period. I employed people, I um, had a vision which I engaged other corporates into. I was able to win awards for the work that I was doing, etc. So, you know, what I realized is that with my hard work, the skills that I'd learnt with a clear vision, I was able to really step into my leadership potential and do some great things. That is excellent. That is really, truly excellent. Uh, I remember, uh, I think it was last year, uh, before this podcast developed into what it is today, where we are now uh, interviewing people, talking to an individual like you who have uh, gained a lot of knowledge and therefore we are sort of redistributing that knowledge to the community. It was a solo podcast. So in one of those uh, uh, episodes, I talked, uh, actually it was the beginning of this year, uh, we talked a lot about uh, soft skills, uh, so that those things, those attributes that you were referring to, uh, like uh, uh, leadership, learning how to organize, learning how to do things, you know, these are attributes that sometimes I think are actually very highly incorporated in our culture, and in fact in all culture. Of course, then it was not referred to as soft skills. It was not referred to as leadership as it were. But imagine now, uh, because there was an example I was giving them, like little children growing up in, in, the, in the village, who shoot a catapult. A bell is sitting on top of a tree, very tall tree. Now somebody that is on the ground, a small child with a small catapult that is holding, shoot a stone and is able to kill the bell. Now that might appear to us as something very normal, no? 
But it's not very normal. It is something that you have to learn. It's a skill. It's a very important skill. It's about focus. It's about aiming. You need to develop this skill. Otherwise, you don't have it. That also have to do something with build houses. You know? Children build mud houses. You know? Or if you are a gay child, you learn how to cook uh, monk food. You know, you learn how to do monk marriage, have monk children, you know, those little things. They might appear as irrelevant, but they are really very relevant because in the society we live in today, a simple thing as learning how to take care of elderly person is not something that is just anybody can do. It's not just a job for anybody, you know. So if we value our culture, if we understand our culture, where we are coming from, then the world we live in today will become a little bit easier for us. But if we don't understand the basis, how our culture are set up, then we don't even know how this world is set up in the, in the first place. So I really want to um, uh, I appreciate that part that you talked about, no? that uh, early age where you were growing up and you have this chance to learn because you were given a responsibility that, of course, you couldn't, have, you couldn't uh, uh, refuse. No? To another question that I really want to ask you is that uh, in the community that we are serving, uh, mainly the immigrant and the African diaspora, uh, there is a part of us uh, that is in, that really need a kind of attention. I'm talking of the stay-at-home women uh, who probably also want to start home businesses because now that we, we the world that we live in today, it is very important that you have something that you are doing of your own. Apart from going to work and earning a salary, which of course we have understood that it's not going to be enough for you to live the kind of life you want to live, it is time for us to take advantage of the internet, of the real free resources that is out there for you. So for these stay-at-home women particularly, who might be, uh, who are probably trying to, try to set up something for themselves online, what do you want to tell them? What kind of advice do you want to give them? Well, I think I'll start with um, a bit of inspiration because um, I started my first business after my second child. And the reason I did uh, was because I needed more flexibility. Flexibility to um, take pay attention to my children's um, upbringing. You know, I was fed up of going to work and making excuses why I was late for work or why I had to leave early. So I thought, you know what, take this into your own hands. And so I set up Amos for recruitment and training with absolutely no funds, with nowhere. I, I really didn't have an office. And my experience of running a business was zero, as in I had no experience of running. A, I hadn't done a course in how to manage your business or anything like that. But what I had was the passion and I had a vision. And I shared that passion and vision with a number of people. And it was two men that built some, um, really got my vision and decided to invest in my business. And so I set up office on Regent Street in central London, something that even I hadn't envisioned at the time when I had created the vision that my office would be on Regent Street in central London, in the Crown Estates. I didn't, that wasn't even a possibility. But because of the passion that I had and I shared with these people, they got it and they wanted to invest and make that vision become a reality. And that's where I started my offices on Regent Street. In, in fact, for the entire time I ran my business, I was on Regent Street. I don't know if you're aware of Regent Street, but it's one of the top locations in London, um, in central London. So it gave me immediate credibility. Funny enough, whenever you told people that you had an office on Regent Street, they didn't believe you initially. And when I'd invite them to the office and they saw where I was, then suddenly you became credible. It's, it's fascinating how people are. They like to associate themselves with success. So anyway, <laughs> the point I'm making is that if you're able to share your dream in a way that people get it, you know, that dream can become a possibility. Now, I started off in a service business, so recruitment and training. So I was looking at how I could actually um, find my first customer, because that was another thing. You need to, okay, I'd got some investment to set up office, but how am I now going to make money? 
So I partnered with an existing company. Again, I shared my vision with them. They believed in the vision and we partnered on our first project. And um, in fact, it was with uh, one of the government departments um, and we got rolling. We started to deliver some training programs for young graduates, which became um, very successful. From there, I started to build contacts in the finance sector um, with very high level brands. Again, something that I, my tiny little business, how am I gonna reach these companies like JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, um, UBS Warburg? How am I going to get to those people? But you know what? Through conversation, I was able to secure business with those organizations. And I went on to do the same in the media sector, um, in um, the health sector, and various other organizations. Um, so for 10 years, um, every day, I got up, went to work, managed my children, managed my home, um, in order to keep my business running. Every day I gave thanks to God because I knew that even though I did not necessarily have all of what I needed when I started the business, I had been graced with the opportunity to grow a business every day. And I used that to, you know, 10 years came very quickly, funny enough. You know, before I knew it, I was celebrating my 10 year anniversary and I was reflecting back and thinking, how did I do that? But it really was you know, I don't know if anyone here is a Christian, but it was by the grace of God that I was able to grow my business to the point that I did. Now, unfortunately, I did become, you know, I did run myself to the ground and had a, a bit of a health issue, which is why I eventually stopped the business. But, um, you know, during that run of 10 years, I really made a mark with something that was just a mere idea in my mind um, and I think my advice to all women who are thinking of starting in their business I would say start because if you know what your vision is start and take each day as it comes and you'll see that with every drop you start to build a mighty ocean thank you very much for that especially the last part um it's quite invoked, you know, that first of all, you're going to have to start. But you look at the ocean, it's a pool of water. In fact, how are you going to be able to measure it? But uh, like <laughs> uh, most uh, um, intelligent people have always said, this drop of water, this, this big ocean is made up of drop of water. So if you want to build an ocean or build a little stream for yourself, begin to drop a little bit of water every day. One day is going to become a big stream of water. So thank you for that. Thank you so much for that, uh, for your experience too. Uh, now, you are in the UK, and you have made this experience in the UK. But originally, you are from Ghana. Oh, you have also made experience in Ghana. With me, you now know both worlds. And of course, a, a huge member of our community also, they are also from Ghana or in other parts of Africa or in other parts of the world. It doesn't matter. So what I want to ask you is, how would you make a comparison? What kind of comparison would you make between the business ecosystem in Ghana and in the UK, so that people can see maybe if there are differences or similarity. Yeah, um, okay, so let me start with my um, story um, as to how I arrived in Ghana. I'm sure you can tell from my accent that <laughs> I'm actually um, born in the UK, brought up in the UK, and moved to Ghana um, when I, um, got to my middle age, you know, mid-career, I decided to move to Ghana, um, which is where my parents are from. Now, um, I'd never lived in Ghana before. No, that's not true, actually. I lived in Ghana for two years when I was between the ages of seven and nine. So I'd always had a longing to go back and live in Ghana because that experience was a very, very pleasant one. So um, when I hit my mid-career and decided to move to Ghana, it was to see how I could um, establish a business there. What I um, quickly realized that um, for me personally, it, starting a business in Ghana was difficult at that time because I had three children. 
And the main focus there was to secure their education. So I found a job, um, a HR role, training and development role um, with a government institution. And I moved from London to Ghana to take on that role. So um, in the 12 years that I was in Ghana, I moved through various roles and eventually set up a small consultancy business. Now, um, as far as your question is concerned, Obi, I would say that doing business in Ghana is um, you, it's a different set of skills. Firstly, the markets are not as mature. You don't have the formal structures like you have here. But in Ghana, what you do have is the flexibility and the networks. So you, you rely heavily on your networks and your rep reputation becomes paramount in the success of your business. Um, and so you have to build up that credibility very quickly. Now, I'm sure the same applies in here, in this country as well. You have to have a good reputation and people have to be able to refer you. If you do good work, then you will be referred. But I think that in a small country like Ghana, it's even more paramount that your reputation is a good one. So in the time that I was in Ghana, um, you know, I worked with um, the companies that I worked with. Most of my roles, I actually got through recommendation. So, but having said that, I would um, apply for the job, having been told that that vacancy existed. So I wouldn't necessarily use the newspaper or, or the um, internet in order to find, look for a job. I would be told about a job. I would apply and be successful on application. So I think the, um, what, I mean, in summary, I would just say that I would want to focus more on the similarities um, because at the end of the day, if you're not a resilient person, working in Ghana or working in, in the UK will be difficult. You have to be resilient because the terrain in business is a tough one. It's not um, easy to navigate your way through business. You have to be bold and courageous. You have to take things sometimes and position yourself in a way that people um, really trust and believe in what you have to offer. So, you know, and I think that applies both here in the UK and in Ghana. Mm -hmm. All right. Th thank you for that. Thank you so much for that. Uh, um, I would like to thing you know, uh, for the fact that, okay, I understand. Uh, in fact, I was thinking that you were born in Ghana and they moved to the UK. Now you clarify the point that actually you were born in the UK. We went to have a little bit of experience, just two years in, in Ghana, okay? Which, of course, is something very, very beautiful because uh, <laughs> now, anyway, I'm not going to go much about that. So what No, I sorry, to... Opie. What I said was that I was in Ghana for 12 years. Ah, sorry. Okay. 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 Yeah, I lived in Ghana for 12 years and I'd only been to Ghana prior to that two, for two years. So when I was young, between the ages of seven and nine, I was in Ghana. Ah, okay. Perfect. Perfect. So I was, I was right there to ask you the question because it means that you actually have a, an experience there. So I was, I was trying to repeat now to say, oh, well, sorry, I didn't. <laughs> it's okay. No problem. No problem. Yeah. All right. I'm an African. That's the bottom line. <laughs> oh, okay. Even though you live in the UK, you are still in Africa. Of course, your parents are in Africa. You have eaten the cane cane and all the whole uh, delicious uh, Ghanaian meal, is it it? Yes. <laughs> and fufu. Fufu. In Nigeria, we eat a lot of fufu. I don't know if you guys do it there. So in Ghana, I know of cane cane because I have some Ghanaian friends and they have made, and they have made me to eat it. Of course, I enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm right. glad you tried Ghanaian food. Of course, I do. I have a lot of Ghanaian friends here. Is is it possible not to? If I can eat Italian food, uh, why why would I eat some African food? I've eaten uh, uh, food uh, from my friends that are um, that are from uh, Senegal, uh, from uh, Ivory Coast, a different kind of African food I've tasted. Of course, they are all highly uh, delicious. You know. <laughs> all right. Now, the thing I want to ask you now, um, Afwan. 
is uh, what, how do you really see the importance of building a business team? I know this one must also relate to a sort of a collaboration because we need to work together. That is uh, a topic that we might not go deep here. On the other channel that is about African diaspora, we did much on that. In fact, I have programs of interview for it uh, in the coming weeks. It had to do with uh, networking and collaboration among African diaspora. But of course, that is not where I'm going right now with this question. Where I'm going is, if you are in business, whether you are in Africa or here in Europe or in the West, how do you see the importance of building a business team, people who might help you to be able to organize things and all that? Please help us with this. Yeah, again, um, Obi, the thing is, um, there is a saying, and I no, let me not even go there because I can't remember the saying, but you can have a vision and try and go it alone, but you will only get so far. But if you have a team, you can go much further. And so I begin my response to this question on that note. Your team is important. In fact, it's crucial to the success of implementing your vision. It gives you the reach. It gives you the, um, the, the know-how. It gives you the, um, you know, helps you to solve certain problems that you may not have even considered. See, one head, um, many heads is better than one. You know, if people are coming from different perspectives, it helps us to look at the problem. Now, when I say, I mean, I've been using the word vision several times in this discussion. But what we're saying here really is that there's a problem that you are passionate about solving. And you're looking at a business, um, a way of solving that problem and generating some income. OK, let's just use that for layman's terms and for the purpose of responding to this question. Now, in solving that problem, OK, and making it available to many. You have to. Take people with certain expertise along with you. Now, these days we have different types of teams. You have virtual teams, you have um, teams that are um, remote, um, you have teams that are high performing, you know, different types of teams that are required in order to do the job. So as a leader, you need to know what type of team that you're going to need in order to build your business. Now, whereas before many of us had teams all sat in one office, open plan offices, you know, different offices, just, uh, you know, HR here, finance there, you know, um, logistics here. Now we have the opportunity through technology to have more remote teams. And so you can deliver the same results with people from all over um, the world. You can acquire skills from all over the world. There are even now platforms like Tinder, um, Fiverr, where you can actually find people with the skills you need and use them for a particular project. So you can build your teams for a specific project and um, have them with you for that short period of time and then build another team. So those hybrid teams, that's another type of team, by the way, um, is another way of building teams. So we've moved away from the traditional way of looking at teams into very many more uh, multifaceted um, team building because of the use of technology. So when we talk about teams, it's a collection of people that come together um, that share a common vision for a either a particular period of time or for um, a specific period of time or for a longer duration. So they're your permanent team. You can have a small team that are your permanent team and then a number of hybrid teams that interact with that permanent team to make your team bigger for a period of time. And then that, that um, hybrid team fall off and then you're left with your core team to continue. I think that's now becoming a common trend for small business because it means that you're not carrying extra overhead um, and paying huge tax bills or um, social security bills for a lot of people 
that may not be doing things that you need all the time. So you bring them in to do specific tasks and then they drop off. So team building um, in our industry has become a lot more dynamic and you have to have the right skills and know-how in order to interact with the different um, types of people that may be joining your team, leaving your team at different points in time. So, you know, even from an administrative point of view, there are things that you have to put in place in bringing teams together. So, for example, if you're using um, a hybrid team, you're bringing in a HR, finance, um, a technical person for a team for a period of time, you may choose a contract process um, and therefore you would need to have the paperwork to support the, those contracts. So they, they become like your, your internal consultants for a fixed period of time. And you'll need to create contracts for, for those people. If you're building a more long-term team, then you'll need to have not only employment contracts for those individuals, but you'll need to have infrastructure in place so that those people can see how to, you know, either grow and develop with your business or to at least know how to work with you to ensure that you keep that team motivated um, on track with where you want to go with your business. So um, I think that kind of gives us an overview of, um, you know, or leading into that conversation around team building, which is something that I'm very passionate about because now we're also looking at more diverse teams. Teams where you bring in people of different um, lived experiences. So for example, you might have, you know, um, people that come from different parts of the world that have different abilities, that have different mindsets. You know, all of that flavor makes the recipe a lot richer and tastier. And you, you find that you're able to resolve your problems a lot quicker because people are looking at things from different perspective, perspectives. So diversity and inclusion now has become a very big topic, particularly around people development and building diverse teams. Um, organizations, big or corporates, are looking at diversity and inclusion, how they can do that more effectively and ensure that their organizations are, um, you know, not looking at their typical um, set of people when they're recruiting, but looking at a broader spectrum of people when they're um, recruiting teams or bringing teams together. So on that note, I think that kind of begins that conversation. I don't know if there's anything more you want me to add there, Ovi. Oh, sure, sure, sure. That is something uh, we are going to add there because uh... I understand that this is something that you are highly passionate about uh, and because you have to do also with connection with building with working together and like i said before we we have an extensive argument on collaboration on networking but of course concentrating on the african diaspora i'm particularly passionate also about this team building thing and uh, also because in your explanation you made mention of a hybrid to uh, Fiverr, to Tinder, uh, even places like Upwork, all these have become very important uh, companies these days. That uh, companies in the in the US and also in UK have taken advantage of uh, mostly. And for people who don't know how this thing works, maybe like for example, there are a lot of workers in the Philippines, for example, who have who have a very uh, low income. Their salary are very low. So big company in the US, we hire these people. They don't really hire the like paying tasks and all those uh, unnecessary for company that <laughs> just tell them, okay do a certain task for me maybe respond to an uh, to an to a telephone call make an email write for me do this certain thing that it would have cost them a lot of money if they have done it in the US or in the UK but because they have these services that is put in place by these long distance uh, 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 workers VA virtual services as it were they have make a lot of money through it and personally, I've been looking around to see if in Africa there are also places like this. Because in Africa too, people have very low income, have very low salary. Uh, so that in Nigeria, for example, if uh, I were to have a virtual assistance here in, in Italy or maybe in UK or US or in Canada, 
where a lot of Nigerian young people that are in school can work. Are they maybe you pay the small money in your currency, but if you transfer that money to them because this these are digital money at the end of the day, maybe they have a PayPal account, you just deposit the money for them. By the time they withdraw this money, it's a huge amount of money for them. So where I actually am going here, Afwa, is among us, African diaspora, is it not possible that from a business perspective, we can also look into this area where we can build network uh, of, um, of virtual assistance to maybe by so doing, we give job to our people back home. But of course, they also do the work because if you don't do the work, I don't pay you. I, I want you to speak to this issue. Yeah, and, and you know, Obi, that's such a good um, um, way to look at um, our economic development um, because there's so much skills, so much talent in Nigeria, in Ghana, in West Africa, for example, that can be trans um, exported to the rest of the world. We've seen India do that. They exported a lot of their service um, back-end um, offices, um, they exported it from India to the rest of the world, America and the UK. And a lot of consultants were brought in to support the financial institutions when they were going through a period of change. And that's because India had built up a lot of technological, technological skills in their country, but people weren't finding work. So they started to export it and found that it Boom, the economy boomed as a result. In Africa, we have similar competencies or different competencies that can be exported. And there are companies that are sprouting even now that are exporting to university, put them as virtual assistants and is offering packages to the rest of the world. And he's doing extremely well. I think the last video that he, sh he reported, he had grown his business in three months, you know, tenfold. And he was actually from the UK, went to Ghana to start this project and um, it just took off. So it just goes to sh show that we have the human resources in Africa. If we can give them even some small training and transfer some of the um, learning that they have into real services we can actually export it using technology so absolutely i think it's a way to go it's something that we can think about um, and certainly people that have the capacity can start to develop it um for you know for the rest of the world to experience and benefit i think it will help to change the perception of africa as well Talking of perception, that is something really strange there. When I first started to notice this, um, this virtual assistant services or things like that, in fact, I, I wanted to quick because after I've seen the value, because I've used them myself, there were times I was uh, doing more in publishing uh, uh, books and all that. So, of course, I cannot do all the work alone, no? so I have to uh, contract people. Sometimes they were, uh, or maybe in India, or in Pakistan, or in Philippines. Uh, but then, of course, I met a lot of friends who, of course, were chatting. And so I begin to understand how this thing work. Then I try to say, okay, let me try to see from the African side of it what is happening there. When I try to make some friends along this line, do you know? Okay, now let me make two comparisons. You know? on on the side of these Eastern people, this whether you're referring to Indian and all that, they will usually propose me, hey, come on, let me organize email for you, let me do this for you, let me do this for you, so I can pay them. But when you made the same connection uh, towards uh, Africa, Nigeria, or things like that, but what they were proposing me is, hey, I will pray for you. Let me connect you to one pastor and all that so that they will pray for you. But uh, the question I was asking myself, why does it have to be like that? Because you made mention of mentality or mindset. That is why I'm bringing this issue in. In that if you organize a pastor connection to me, how are you going to benefit from it now? If you pray for me, what is going to be your reward from it? So I'm looking at that is probably a kind of misplaced of priorities sometime in, in Africa among us, maybe because the kind of education that we are giving is not really directing us to the correct way. And because if we do not change this kind of mentality, even this proposal that we are talking about, I don't think it's going to work. 
Because the internet, the same internet that is available to people in the US is, a, is the same that is available in China, the same that is available in Malaysia, in Philippines. If in Africa we use it to pray, to organize how we can make a, a meet a pastor and do miracle, while the other people are using it for connection or how to do business and benefit, then we are going to <laughs> we are going to suffer. We are basically going to suffer. So on the question of mentality, that is what I will respond to. I don't know if you want to say anything about that. Well, I think, you know, we're going to see an evolution because the young people now are using their technology in a different way. They, they, they don't want to be pastors. In fact, they've, they've had enough of listening to pastors. I know certainly in Ghana, we're seeing a lot of um, young people moving and using technology in a way that is a bit more adventurous. They're selling things online. You know, I know young women that are doing Instagram businesses, you know, selling shoes, selling handbags, selling, you know, making and, and, and delivering those items to people. So I think you'll see a different generation coming through. You know, it's, it's not just going to be about church service. It will be far more than that. We'll see trade business being interacted online. All right. Thank you for that. In fact, that is what we are looking into because um, we are going to be the one to save ourselves. Uh, because uh, like uh, we were talking about before, there is really a huge, a huge potential in Africa. Many people might not see, but it is true. Because we are talking from the point of view of human, of human resources to, uh, to, uh, to natural resources. It's not only a crude oil that is available in Nigeria. We are talking about 200 million people the people that th these are not illiterate. Uh, some of them are really highly qualified. They are able to do a lot of things. So we need to really tap into this area. We need to really tap into this area. So for the Africans in diaspora, for the uh, all the different African in diaspora, we need to be looking into this area because it doesn't necessarily mean that for us to help in Africa, it means sending money. That might not really be what the people need in Africa. I said it again before in this podcast. When you do that. How many people are you going to be able to send money to? But if you send idea, if you organize idea, of course, work together with people, then you'll be able to reach more and more people. Now, having said that, I'm interested in trying to understand because all these years you have worked with different people, you have built team, work with teams. Now, I don't want you to tell me that it has all been rosy. So what are also the challenges? Because the people that we are trying to encourage to go into business, they want to understand, they must understand that it is not going to be 100% all the time. Sometimes you are going to have challenges. So what have been your own challenges personally in this team building and businesses? You see, um, I think a lot of people, when they take on others to join them in their business, there's a mentality of you know, exploitation. But what I want people to understand is that when you employ people into your business, treat them as a resource. How can you get the best out of that resource? And I see that in Africa or in Ghana, let me be specific. People are in jobs where they're not happy. They're in jobs because they're underpaid, they are demotivated, discouraged, they're not even thinking, they're just showing up to work every day, sitting at a desk, fiddling around, having cups of tea and going home. That is a waste of everybody's time. It's a waste of the employer's time and the employee's time. The reason why you've taken that person on is to do a job. And so you have to make the most out of ensuring that that person does the job. So, you create an environment. That environment should be a professional one, okay? You should not mix professional and personal relationships in the workplace because that brings all sorts of complications. Yes, create a friendly work environment, but you should avoid making it an informal arrangement where you don't have contracts, where you're not following any laws, where you're, you know, um, you're mixing the two, you know, and, and that's where companies get into trouble, where sexual harassment becomes an issue, for example, because their lines are not very clear. 
the lines between work and business is not very clear. It should be made clear to anyone that you engage that they are here to do a job and therefore these are the job, this is your job description, this is the contract that we have between us, okay? You come to work at a certain time, you leave at a certain time. These are the things that I need you to do every quarter, by the end of a quarter, by the end of a day, sorry, by the end of a day, by the end of a quarter, by the end of half a year, by the end of the year. I want to see that you've been able to achieve some of these objectives. And if not, it can, it will have an effect. And I'm going to pay you for that service. That pay should be commensurate to the level of job that is designed, you know, so that the person feels that in return for the service they're offering, they're getting a commensurate pay. And I think if we can get some of these things right in Africa, we'll start to see our businesses grow and develop. What we don't see is that people are using people. They, that's why I, I use the term exploitation. They're using people to do all sorts of things that are not achieving the overall objectives of the business, you know. And as a result, the staff, after being there for some time, become discouraged and then they become non-productive or unproductive. They're not doing anything. They're demotivated. So they're just coming and wasting your time. You know, and I think that I have seen experiences I, or I've had experiences in my job where you have corrupt staff. They get corrupted. And there are many reasons why staff can become corrupted. Where they start stealing from you, where they start um, selling your business somewhere else where they're not supposed to where they, they even stealing hours from you is important for you to know that your your business has hours that is assigned to do that business. And if a staff member comes into the office and they're not doing that work, they're stealing hours. So for three hours that they you're paying them, they're actually, and they're not doing that job, that's theft. You know, and you can be, the employee can be held accountable for that. These are the kind of things I want businesses to understand. I think we don't take our human resources very seriously. There's a reason why we call it human resources and that professionals are employed to manage that resource because one, it's the most expensive resource and two, has to be managed. It needs to be managed and by a professional. My work comes with um, not just the administrative side of things, but I also have to understand the mind, how the human mind works, the psychology of humans, so that I can get the best out of people, how I can best motivate people. So those two, so those, so, so those are some of the factors that influence or inform the way I do my job. A lot of people think that HR is just administration. No, it is not. It comes with a lot more than that. All right. Thank you so much, Afua. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the time. We have come to the end of the podcast, but of course, I'm going to ask you the last uh, question uh, because we really have learned a lot of things today. In fact, uh, <laughs> I'm sure I'm very positive that those that are listening to us are also learning a lot of things from, from what we are discussing here. All right. Now, to conclude the podcast, I'm going to ask you to uh, share with me your best three strategy for business owners this time, small businesses, or those who are trying to run their businesses, whether from home, they could be in Africa or here or whatever. What are the three best strategies to manage their business? Assuming they are even a low or maybe with a few people, what is the best managing strategy that they should know as small business owner? Um, I think it's important to have a performance management structure in your business. So you need to know if your business is performing or it's not performing. And it's not just by saying, OK, we, we need to earn X amount of income every day in order to show that our business is working. Um, you, you have to have performance management structures. That would be my first um, strategy that I would recommend is in place when you have a business. The second 
is your human resource strategy. I think that is also a very important um, strategy to have, particularly if you have more than five employees. Um, you should know what that resource is coming to do, what you intend to do with them in the future, and um, how much you intend to invest in their growth and development. You know, those are some of the factors you need to consider in that strategy. And the third would obviously be your financial strategy, your business plan, but um, business plan as a whole, but your financial plan specifically. What is your uh, financial goals and objectives? So that you can see your business grow and develop over time. So those will be my three strategies that I would focus on HR, finance and. Um, ooh, I forgot what was the third one no, I no, said, no. OB? Are you listening? They've got they've got it all the point. They've got it all the point. So they, <laughs> <laughs> financing, making sure that there is a, a kind of um, that when you are working, there is a way to value the the, the the job that you are putting at the end of the day. No, so uh, yeah, those are the those are the three points have been have been clear. All right, now is there something that you would like to add to the conversation to to Andy? But I, because I think you already actually responded to to all the questions. Well, um, I think, Obi, I just want to commend you for doing this work. Um, you know, it's not easy, um, but it's necessary. And it's leaders like you that put themselves out there so that we see our, um, the diaspora connect better with our continent. So, you know, well done. Keep up the good work. And I hope that your audience um, continues to grow over time and um yeah so anything i can do to support that journey i'll be more than happy to do thank, thank you thank you so much Afua. thank you so much i really i appreciate your time and your contribution not just your time but what you put in the time and uh, so i really appreciate it and for our audience i say thanks to all of you and because if you are not there we will not be here it's a relationship one we are here but you are also yeah, so I want to thank you for having accompanied us to the end of this podcast. We value your time. But pay attention to what uh, Afwa has said. These are highly valuable information. Say, for example, you are among African, uh, uh, in, where you are among African diaspora, uh, taking advantage of the VA service. This is something that is not of a small value. Take an example also of what is happening in Ghana according to our explanation. We have a huge resources among us, even those of us that are here. Uh, anyway, I'm not going to go into the conversation of how a class is started, which is a, 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 a product that started from a research background. We discovered that within the community in Italy here, there is a huge resources of the people. So we cannot all stay here and be complaining that of this and that way we should be able to do something. This is from the background that we exist. So I want us to try to take advantage of the opportunity that we have. For example, the internet. You can do a lot of things on the internet. Don't just waste your time going there to pray. It is not going to save you, it's not going to help you. Try to invest in something, invest, I mean, invest your time in something that can give you a return. Of course, it might not give you the return immediately, but it's going to give you a return over time. So I want you to take advantage of that. So again, dear Afwa, I thank you so much for the time and I'm definitely going to be speaking to you again.